Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Really appreciate you taking some time to join us for, uh, I think, this exciting topic. My name is Tegan Clary. I'm the Vice President of Marketing at Unchained Labs. And I'm here today with Indira Carey, one of our application scientists. Um, I've been really excited about this topic. Um, we have many customers that are using our Lunatic UV Biz instrument to really change how they're doing their quality control and how they're doing their analysis of um, quantitation of DNA, uh, RNA, and other nucleic acids, or those nucleic acids, um, specifically as a part of their genomics workflows. Uh, many people don't need to go down into the ultra low sensitivity um, range to be able to do a really fast, um, really, really good measurement um, of these two types of molecules. Uh, Indira will speak to both of those today. Uh, for any of you that would like to ask questions, uh, don't forget in, there's a Q&A button in the Zoom navigation bar. All you have to do is click on that and you can ask any of your questions that you might have today. Um, I'll be passing those over to Indira and I'm sure she'll be excited to answer them for you today. So, hey Indira, uh, nice to see you this morning here in the US. Um, why don't you go ahead and take it away and tell us about Lunatic and how people can implement it in their workflows. Great, uh, thank you Tegan so much for that introduction. Hello everyone and thank you again for joining us today. When you try to tackle something that takes a lot of steps like this SpongeBob cake, the odds that something can go wrong really increase the more steps there are. So if you have too many complicated steps, things can go very wrong and you end up with something like this thing over here on the right. Nucleic acid quantification is the same way. It's best to keep things simple. Fluorescence protocols are multi-step. They require dilutions, they take time, they use costly reagents, and they can also introduce pipetting errors which negatively impact results. Our big lunatic is a full spectrum UV vis spec, which requires only two microliters per sample and no dilution steps, nor standard curves. Lunatic can measure up to 96 samples at a time in just five minutes. Now that's done using our plates with a single micro cuvette. Using our plates with two micro cuvettes, which allow reading higher concentration samples, a full 96 well plate will actually take only 12 minutes. Our plates have a standard SBS footprint, so they're compatible with liquid handling robots. The analysis software, easy to use, and data easily exported. We'll discuss some of the advanced analytics capabilities a little later in the presentation. This example shows the impact that multi-step procedures have on readout accuracy. This experiment was actually run by one of our high throughput customers. And what they did was to measure thousands of genomic DNA samples using either Lunatic or PicoGreen. Now, based on those results, the samples were adjusted to 25 nanogram per microliter and read again. You can see there's a much wider variation in the results with Pico Green compared to the samples that were read on the Lunatic. Fluorescent methods require that samples fall within the range of known standards. And this can be challenging because fluorescent methods have a smaller dynamic range, which means they saturate easily. In the experiment shown here, you can see the linearity for samples that were read using Big Lunatic across a wide concentration range. And you can actually also see the saturation effect with Pico Green. This curve was generated using the same samples as for Big Lunatic, but the samples were actually diluted 100 fold. Now, because of the limited dynamic range with a fluorescent method, a sample might actually have to be diluted multiple times so that it actually falls on that standard curve. On the other hand, Lunatic offers a wide dynamic range with reproducibility and accuracy without the hassle of standard curves and dilutions. Using DNA from high quality extraction methods, 
generates comparable results between lunatic and pico green. And we're showcasing that here with results from the UK Biobank cohort. This was actually a massive genotyping project involving about a half a million participants. Results from almost 500,000 samples show strong correlation in readouts using lunatic compared to pico green. Importantly, there was also no difference in the quality of downstream data. Now, how does our Big Lunatic do all this? Well, Big Lunatic is the only system out there that can measure nucleic acids at high throughput and high concentration. The microfluidic circuit with two fixed path lengths, as you can see highlighted here, actually covers a wide dynamic range from 0 0.03 up to 275 OD. The unique microfluidic circuits that are molded into lunatic plates and chips ensure there's no cross-contamination or evaporation. Now, once a sample is loaded, it's pulled into this reservoir area here by capillary action. When the sample hits a hydrophobic point, it stops. At this step, the sample can actually sit for up to two hours before reading with no evaporation. After the plates loaded into the instrument, the empty microcuvettes are read, and that removes any absorbance contribution from the plastic. A pump will then apply a small vacuum, which moves the sample, samples into the microcuvettes for reading. There are path length absorbance standards for microvolume specs that are certified by the National Institutes of Standards and Technology. Uracil and tryptophan NIST standards were used to show that our fixed path length is correct and reproducible. This means that Big Lunatic generates data you can trust. Here we're showcasing the linearity and reproducibility of a DNA dilution series, and the R squared value indicates great correlation. Here's another look at linearity and reproducibility. In this case, we have a DNA dilution series of cap thymus DNA from 25 nanograms per microliter up to 1400 nanogram per microliter. And note the low CV values across this dilution range. Zooming in on the lower end of this DNA dilution series really highlights the reproducibility between quadruplicate samples, even at these lower concentrations. And we also see similar accuracy and reproducibility with a calf liver RNA dilution series. Note again, the same great results at lower RNA concentrations. Groups that are producing plasmids, for example, are typically working with high concentrations. I spoke with a customer recently who was getting variable results due to sample dilutions that were required with their old method. And for that group, Lunatic was actually a great solution because they could read their high concentration samples without dilution. And the data shown here demonstrates how Big Lunatic handles high concentration samples without dilution with the same great accuracy and reproducibility. The highest concentration of DNA in this dilution series was 12.8 microgram per microliter. And you can see the nice R squared value, which showcases the high correlation. Here we're looking at results from, from a sample of high quality calf thymus DNA in TE buffer. Now this is a typical result for a clean sample. You can see the expected peak maximum at 260 nanometers and the quality ratios are within an acceptable range. Note also the accuracy and reproducibility. We're seeing nice low standard deviations and coefficient of value uh, readouts for triplicate reads. For the experiment shown here, calf thymus DNA in TE buffer 
was spiked with beads to simulate bead carryover from purification. Now on the left, we're looking at results using a conventional background subtraction method where 340 nanometers is used for our background subtraction. The A260, A230 ratio is a little high, but could still be acceptable. Lunatic software allows data to be analyzed with different background subtraction methods without having to rerun the experiment. Now on the right, we've recalculated the data using our classic turbidity background correction, which accounts for scattering across the entire spectrum. And you can now actually see the high background in the spectrum, that's this line here, that's caused by the beads. Now, accounting for the bead turbidity background allows us to get a more accurate value for the DNA concentration. And you can actually see the differences in concentration between the two methods. The flexibility of the lunatic software to use different background subtraction methods really allows you to quickly gather additional information about the sample. And the benefit is being able to make an informed assessment of how the sample will perform in downstream applications. In addition to choice of background correction method, Lunatic offers another advanced analytic capability that's called OnMix. What OnMix does is to identify the presence of common contaminants in the sample. The software will analyze the sample spectrum, then apply specific algorithms that deconvolute that information to reveal contaminants based on their characteristic spectra. And here's the result of a DNA sample analyzed with OnMix. The black line represents the spectrum before deconvolution. OnMix identifies excess protein and salts, and that's the blue line that's shown here. In the results table, the salt present is identified as guanidine thiocyanate. This sample would likely have to be repurified before using it in a downstream application. In addition to the capabilities we've discussed so far, Big Lunatic also meets the needs of labs working in larger scales. For these high throughput needs, the plates used for Big Lunatic are compatible with liquid handling robots. We have a number of comprehensive and informative applications notes on the Lunatic webpage. So please do check these out to learn more about what can be done on the Lunatic. I started off our discussion today with a photo of a SpongeBob cake where the results from a multi-step complex process were less than ideal. In contrast, a much simpler recipe with fewer steps would, would likely have yielded better results for our baker. Today, we've discussed how nucleic acid quantification can be done simply and elegantly using our Big Lunatic with great results, just like the cake shown here. With Big Lunatic, there's no diluting, no dyes, and no standard curves. Just drop and go. Hey, great talk, Indira. Thanks for taking us through that. Um, I think we have a bunch of great questions that are going to, I think, take the conversation a little further into some people's specific application uh, questions and uses. So uh, let's go ahead and dive into those, OK? OK. Um, the first one, you, you talked about uh, the Pico Green workflow specifically. Um, does Pico Green underestimate nucleic acid concentration? And do we happen to know why? So one of the things with Pico Green is it can be influenced by salts, for example, that could be present in the sample. Um, so one of the benefits with Lunatic is that with the on-mix application, you're actually able to deconvolute that information from the sample at helping you to pull out a more accurate reading for the sample. In fact, um, this could be a challenge uh, for customers that are working with Pico Green. I recently had a conversation with one of our customers who's using the Lunatic. And one of the reasons that this particular group was really interested in the Lunatic and adopted it to their workflow 
was because they were really interested in seeing for their particular sample type or their downstream applications, whether they were actually having salt contamination in samples that, were actually, that was actually impacting their peak of green. So what was, what was really neat from this conversation was learning how this particular lab was able to incorporate the lunatic to give them some additional information that was really helping them to make some qualified judgments about their sample and what might need it to be improved with the workflow. Okay, great, great. Okay, a couple of questions about the um, the consumable our, our plate. Um, mm -hmm. First one is, can somebody reuse a well? Can you rerun a sample on the same well? Okay, so actually you cannot reuse a well. And the reason for that is because when the plate is loaded into the instrument, we actually take a background reading of that empty well. And that helps to remove any possible absorbance contribution from the plastic. And then the sample is actually moved into the well to be read. And so that's the reason why you can't reload a sample into a well that's already been used. Okay, great. Um, another one, does somebody need to run an entire plate of samples or can you just run a couple at a time? What, how, how are people using it? How do we use it? Sure. So you could actually run just one well if that's something that you wanted to do. Um, so in addition to the plates that we offer, we also have a setup where you can actually run individual strips as well. So it can really adapt to the amount of samples that you have. Okay, great. Um, Indira, you, we, you mentioned that um, accuracy of 2% and precision of 1%. Is that true over the entire absorbance range? So the, the accuracy and precision um, numbers that we share cover the range from 1 OD to 200 OD. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that's the range that covers that accuracy and precision. Okay. And you know, in your experience or from what we've seen, how does that compare to a nano drop system? Somebody's asking that. Oh, so Lunatic actually offers superior accuracy and precision in a high throughput format compared to nano drop. And one of the benefits for the Lunatic really has to do with the, the fixed path length that we have, which has to do with the design of the plates. And you may recall from the data that we showed. Um, there, we did have some data that showed how the path length is, is really reproducible across instruments using those NIST standards. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, here's a question just about uh, kind of protocol here. So the uh, a question is that a lab does an RNAs treatment. Mm -hmm. um, so they're pretty confident there's only DNA left in the sample. Mm -hmm. um, and they've checked that by other methods. Do you, yeah. Would they be missing out on something or missing out if they didn't use Pico Green after running that RNAs treatment? Is there something they'd be missing? Well, the one of the challenges with Pico Green, and again, this has really come up in different conversations that I've had with several of our customers in different lab spaces using, using different types of, of samples, is that with the Pico Green method, you really aren't getting an assessment of what additional contaminants per se are in the sample. So one of the things that you're going to be able to get on the Lunatic with the UV Viz readout is you're gonna get that quality assessment. You can get that A to 60 to 30 ratio, right? You could get the A to 60 to 80 ratio. And that gives you some valuable information about whether there are other contaminants that have been co-purified that are carrying along in your sample and that happen to be co-absorbing, right? And that's really valuable information that you get from using the lunatic. On top of that, another advantage is with the unmix application, which we talked a little bit about that today, is you can get additional information about some common contaminants that may co-purify. So guanidine thiocyanate salts, for example, um, phenol or detergents that could be in the sample and may impact downstream um, performance, 
you'll be able to get those assessments and get a really good judgment for, okay, how does my sample look? Um, and get an assessment of whether it would be successful in a downstream application. Right, okay. That somebody had also asked that question, what are some of the contaminants? I think you just, you just oh, answered that. Yeah, okay. So I, I have also seen um, some of our customers using Unmix to um, really optimize their right, extraction purification uh, part of the workflow because you can actually try to, you can deconvolute out some of those contaminants so know that they're there and then know that something maybe is not quite right upstream. So there's some advantages to having that those deconvolution for developing the, the, the method in the workflow. And then once you get it dialed in, you just go back to running the A260 and you just crank through samples, right, with Lunatic. So Right, exactly, Tang, and that's actually a really great point. Yes. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Hey, um, how does Lunatic handle oligonucleotides? So those kind of like more, more you know, um, not not necessarily the hey, we're getting the DNA and RNA out of you know a, a, a human sample, but some of these things being made by people for other purposes. Oh, sure, absolutely. Um, Taken. That's a good question because we don't often talk about oligos. So oligos can be read on the lunatic, and the software actually offers a really nice feature where it uses either the molar extinction coefficient and molecular weight to determine the concentration factor or you can actually also use the sequence of your oligo for concentration factor determination. So you can get a nanogram per microliter or picomole per microliter concentration readout, which is really nice as someone who has done a lot of manual calculations using oligos. I was really excited when I realized that Lunatic could do this with the software. Yes, I'm a fan. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, Indira, I think this is this is a question just about UV vis technology in general. So mm -hmm. Unmix, um, we mentioned it, but can it be used to distinguish single stranded from double stranded DNA? I think this is a question we get pretty commonly. Sure. So Unmix actually cannot differentiate between single stranded and double stranded DNA. It does, however, take and have the ability to differentiate between RNA and DNA. And that just has to do with the spectral differences because of that slight difference in base composition between um, DNA and RNA. Mm -hmm. um, somebody, uh, if this is a long question, but I think it's an important one because this is where mm -hmm. people, uh, many of our customers are seeing huge benefits using the, the 96 well plate, like low volume system. Um, you know, this person says their, their lab is using a lot of dye and a lot of um, the sample prep reagents. And the question here is, is, can we speak a little bit to the cost savings of going to UV biz? And the other part of this is, um, you know, time saving and throughput is clear mm -hmm. on, on Lunatic, but do we have customers that have decided to go to UV biz specifically for getting throughput, but also to save in, uh, on costs? Yes, actually, Tegan, we definitely have. Um, you know, I don't know if there's additional information that you want to add on top of that, but I have interacted with a few folks lately where that was definitely a concern. And even for folks that are using Pico Green within the workflow, because it's something that they have to do for the um, process that they have in place, the additional benefit of Lunatic in addition to the cost saving is that they can actually use Lunatic to your point earlier to kind of dial in, you know, what's the concentration that I need to use to go to my peak of green, which is the final readout that, that I need. So even if you, you incorporate Lunatic ahead of using peak of green, I found that customers see a value and a benefit there. And Tegan, I don't know if that's something you wanted to expand on a little bit with your expertise as well. Yeah, um, some of, I think we have many customers that made the decision to move over to the Lunatic system, um, one for the throughput, but two, uh, I think the time savings is a cost savings in general, especially if you're um, you know, going to a multi-channel pipetter, running a lot of samples, or even connecting an automation system. But um, if any of you would like to talk to us about specific cost savings per sample, um, in the entire workflow with regards to using the reagents and the dyes, um, we'd be happy to talk to you about that cost analysis. I think it depends on every different person's workflow and what they're doing. So we'd be happy to speak with you about what are you doing, how much are you using, and then what the cost would be per sample in comparison. 
So that's something I would suggest if somebody here today is interested in, reach out to us and we'll, we'll talk to you about that. But the cost savings are, are there, okay? Um, so just, just let us know if that's something you wanna dive into further. Okay, um, Indira, another question, just uh, moving over to uh, just some other contaminants. This is a, uh, I have never had this question. I don't actually know the answer. So, but okay. can unmixed <laughs> detector, can we detect bacteria in samples? Hmm, so let me think about that one. Um, so I'm not sure if the question is, um, it's as it, I'm interpreting it as asking about bacterial contamination of a sample. Right, I think that's what they're asking, yeah. Okay. Um, like, you know, I think the reality there is, is the whole bacteria, probably not, right? But as a contaminant itself, if it's there, uh, you know, another person asked the question, can lunatic quantify protein samples as well? Right, right. right. I'll let you speak to that as well. But I think if bacteria um, is giving off a, some kind of specific protein signal and it's very large, the, the system will see it. I think it will really be a very large contaminant that would mess up your sample. So you probably see it, but um, that's one, that's one we haven't really tested in a theory, in, in a lot of, uh, with a lot of effort because typically those are purified out. But. Right, right. Um, and and Tegan, just to add on a little bit to that, you know, to, to Tegan's point, you know, I was trying to think of in terms of, you know, if the bacteria were broken open, and so there's uh, DNA, let's say DNA contamination of the sample, you might see a really high DNA reading, right? which for that sample, based on your experience of running it, might look a, a little bit odd. Um, you know, we would want to dial into if there were particular things about the, the DNA, the, the carryover of the bacteria that we might be able to pick up with the um, absorbance. Yeah, that's an interesting one, so. Right. Um, so can you speak just briefly to like protein quantitation and what, you know, can the system do that as well? Yeah, absolutely. The system can uh, read proteins. We have a number of different um, applications for reading proteins. In fact, because the lunatic is a full spectrum fluorescent spec, there are a lot of different things that we're able to do if you, you know, if you happen to have maybe something in the sample that's absorbing at a different wavelength outside of your normal 260 or 280, there are actually some, um, some things that we can do to actually set up methods that allow you to maybe pick up something else that's coming through in the sample. Okay, okay. Uh, I think we have time for a couple more here. So um, you talked about the turbidity correction, Indira, um, and this is a good question. Our plate reader, this person says their plate reader does a single wavelength correction. Mm -hmm. So what's the basis for the turbidity correction? And you know, I think maybe why are we doing it that way? Right, right, exactly. So what the turbidity correction does is it's actually a wavelength specific scatter correction across the spectrum. So typically, if you're working with a, a method where you're purifying your nucleic acid using a bead-based method, whether it's a silica bead or it could even be magnetic beads, what can happen is you can have a little bit of that bead carry over in the sample. In fact, with magnetic beads, when I've worked with these in the past, you might actually see a little bit of brown discoloration in the sample. It doesn't impact the downstream um, workflow necessarily, but it can impact the absorbance uh, readout, as you saw with the data that I showed in the talk. So what the turbidity correction does is it looks across the spectrum, picks up that scatter correction, and then just pulls it out from the contribution of the absorbance, so you end up getting a more accurate um, readout for your nucleic acid. Okay, and, and another one just on, I, I think, you know, extraction and the use of uh, A260. So um, this person says their extraction isn't always super clean, right? I think people mm -hmm. do struggle with these, this part of the workflow. Uh, can they use A260 just to do a good ballpark approximation, right, of the, the DNA mm -hmm. that came through and uh, kind of as the quality control, can they use just straight A260? Right, so yes, you can actually do that. And in fact, another benefit as I'm thinking through this question that the Lunatic software will offer is it's really easy to recalculate your data using a different application. 
So one of the things that could be applicable in a situation like this, Tegan, for a sample where you're not quite sure what else is in there, is to read it first at 260 and then read it with the on mix application just to kind of see, okay, what else is popping out here, right? Am I picking up additional um, contaminants that perhaps I may not have realized that those were in there? But the 260 is a great place to start. Mm -hmm. um, okay, last two quick ones. You just briefly mentioned this, but can Lunatic determine DNA and RNA individually in one sample? Is that something that it's capable of doing? With the OnMix application, yes, we do have an OnMix um, application that will actually allow us to, um, to differentiate between DNA and RNA. Right. Um, I, I'll speak to that too. I, again, working with some, some, some of our customers that run in very high throughput, they typically, before they do a um, you know, full run of many, many samples, they run the OnMix application to really just check on contaminants, but also to make sure that the, um, you know, that the RNA's treatment has worked and that it is not there. Um, or they're, you know, they're actually looking to see if there's RNA in the sample in gener general, because that's what they're interested in. But primarily people will run that, uh, the unmix application, which we've worked with them and helped them um, to, to basically understand that deconvolution. But then when they go to run the full set of samples, they go right back to the A260 after checking the procedure. Because typically once you dial it in, you don't have the issue, right, per, on, on individual samples. So, okay, our last, I think our last question for today, Indira, is just what's the range that UV Viz can detect on this? Right. Yep, yeah. so I mentioned earlier that the Lunatic is actually a full spectrum. And so the wavelength range that we can detect is between 230 nanometers up to 750 nanometers. So depending on what you're wanting to do, um, you're able to detect in that range. Okay, great. Okay, well, hey, um, thank you to, to everyone who joined us today. Uh, and Indira, thank you for you know, taking, taking us through uh, how the Lunatic works um, and how it can be a true alternative to running the uh, dye-based assays and that it can truly give you high throughput, small sample consumption, uh, label-free quantitation of DNA and RNA. So really appreciate you doing that. Um, if anybody has any follow-up questions for us, please don't hesitate to reach out to us and we'd be love to talk to you more. Um, our team is phenomenal at doing virtual demos of our instruments. So please ask us to do, to do a virtual demo of the, the Lunatic for you if you're interested. We can set that up just like this over Zoom, but make it more intimate and answer all of your questions that you might have. Um, so don't hesitate to reach out to us. And Vera is one of those application scientists, and I know she'd love to talk to you about uh, this workflow. So thank you for your time today, and I uh, hope you have a great rest of your day.